and we're back thank you so much people who are still with us or if you've just arrived reminder this is an adventure research charity chatathon where i'm doing a 12 and a half hour marathon live stream talking to 60 i always can't forget the number i think it's 68 researchers and special guests throughout the day talking about their research uh, and this is covering everything from what's going on in the brain to practical things that are happening out there in, in care research and clinical research and everything in between. This session is about the great outdoors and technology to help. I'm going to turn that one off and turn this one on and go, hello, Esme. Esme. Hello. This is Dr. Esme Wood, who's a senior lecturer in occupational therapy at the University of Leicester, uh, Gloucester. Sure. Why don't you introduce yourself, Esme? Sorry. That's all right. Hi. Oh, I'm slightly uh, losing the plot now. It's, I haven't had any more coffee. I need more coffee. I think you're doing really well. I had a Red Bull. Uh, if my camera suddenly goes off, it, it's because I'm making coffee. That's fine. Sure. <laughs> um, so, shall I tell you a little bit about the research? Um, well, wait a second. So, um, oh, okay. you can just say hello. I'm Esme. <laughs> Oh, hello, I'm Esme. And, uh, I'm Dr Esme Wood, I should say. <laughs> I'm an occupational therapist and academic at the University of Gloucestershire. Thank you. And we've got Stefan and Stephen, and you're both um, in Exeter. Yeah, that's right. We're um, knowledge exchange officers and research fellows. So we're partly research and then partly um, working closely with um, uh, businesses, organisations and people with dementia to kind of realise some projects. I can't help but think that that Esme might come away from this rather envious that she wishes she had somebody exactly like you, as does everybody, who is dedicated to supporting the spread of their research. It sounds like um, you've got the most brilliant jobs. And are you going to do a double act or are you going to take it in turns? I think we're going to kind of a bit of both. So we're going to kind of, the project has multiple streams. So there's the business side and then there's people to dementia. So Stefan's been mostly doing lately looking at the business side and I've been looking at more people's dementia so we kind of speak about each of our own bits but we that can't both do everything though so. complete sense I have questions mm -hmm. um but Esme why don't you um I'm going to turn my camera off for a second while you tell us all about your work sure thank you very much okay so um the research that I conducted was a small scale qualitative study and it really it was focused on looking at the lived experience of people who have dementia and who live with dementia and we were looking at their experiences of using GPS technologies, and that causes a court, covers a broad spectrum of potential devices and gadgets, but to access the outdoors and importantly to engage in meaningful occupations. So as an occupational therapist, you can imagine uh, in my clinical practice, I was finding that I was working with lots of people who had dementia, um, who wanted to continue doing the things that they'd always done that defined them, that were part of their identity. So people would say to me, I'm a fisherman, I'm a cyclist, I, this is what I am, not just what I do. It's important to who I am. And for those people, I spotted that there was an awful lot of people who were using the kind of technologies that were available. So things like GPS trackers on their phones, Google Maps, um, running watches, anything they could get their hands on, really, to support themselves to get out there and continue doing the occupations that mattered to them. Now, when I looked at the research literature, I couldn't find anything like this. Everything about GPS technology was about tracking people who might get lost and all about risk and surveillance. And I found that actually... Um, the experience I was seeing in my clinical practice just wasn't reflected in the research literature. So we set about doing this study to try and rectify that and start to find out a bit more about this experience. And I didn't want to test a particular piece of kit and I didn't want to um, uh, look at it from a, a health professional's point of view, from those who prescribe technology. I really want to understand what it was like to, to use this technology, the lived experience of the people who have dementia themselves and are using this technology. So hence, it became quite a small scale study. We had um, 12 participants who had dementia, who um, uh, we undertook qualitative in-depth interviews with. And then there was 12 carers in a separate study. They were not the carers of the original cohorts. So essentially two separate sets of people and we looked at a range of things we looked at the type of technology they used to understand what, what they were using how they used it and why they used it for me the really juicy bit was about why they used it and what the benefit was and what motivated people to do this 
So I guess initially the, the key thing we found was that people used any kind of piece of technology they could get their hands on. They liked to use things that they'd used before in some way or they were familiar with, but they were quite happy to do a form of sort of bricolage where they put together different technologies in a kind of DIY sense to get the intended functional outcome they wanted. Um, and we found that people were really, really keen to use technology in an independent, autonomous way to wayfind rather than to be tracked, which is interesting when you think that most of that technology is presumed to be for tracking people rather than for people to wayfind with dementia. Um, the reason that they did it was all about their uh, importance of the occupations they engaged in. So um, I had, for example, a lady who told me that I'm a runner, it's what I do. And um, traditionally within an occupational therapy group, I might in, in, encourage her to come to a running group and, and try and get her to run with others for safety. And so she can't get lost and as part of engaging in things that matter to her. She just said to me, no, I don't do that. I run on my own. I run long, long distances on my own. This is what is I do. And this is how I define my identity as a person. This is what I want to do. So she used a really clever combination of a running watch and a phone app to enable her to do huge distances and have a way of working out where she was and how long she'd been out because she would forget those things as part of her um, uh, memory deficits as part of her dementia um, but she used the technology and she was supported by her partner to, to set it up but she was able to continue using it for a really 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 long time and she trained for a marathon using this technology and ran that marathon really successfully and um, what I saw consistently um, when interviewing people and in the findings we showed was that the things that really mattered to people were the occupations that they had either done all their lives or that they'd chosen very specifically to do at this stage in life as a way they wanted to spend their time. And if these were outdoor occupations, they didn't want to do them indoors. They didn't want a watered down version. If you're a fl fly fisherman, you do that in the middle of the river. You don't do that anywhere else. And they wanted to be in these outdoor environments and you couldn't simulate that. So my clinical practice previously would have been so somebody did something that we would deem potentially dangerous or we'd be worried about them getting lost or how would we find them if they did get lost and we'd, we'd have all these concerns as a clinical service. Um, I would encourage them to do something slightly different. So if you like being in nature, come on a walking group. But actually, People would say to us, no, I don't want to do that. I want to fly fish in the middle of the current in the in the depths of the woodland. I don't really want to do this with a group. But this kind of technology is being used and I see it clinically and our research showed that it is being used. Um, I may have only a small sample, but we've seen that consistently people are using it in incredibly innovative and smart ways to continue to do the thing that matters to them. And as a, a, a a kind of group of technologies, this use is not very well understood, it's not very well known. And certainly as an occupational therapist, what I really wanted to do was see the knowledge about how this technology is being used spread amongst other clinicians and social workers and other people to see this as a very viable option as to how we support people to continue go go out and do the things that matter to them. So if somebody says to you, I want to go on a 20 mile bike ride, instead of immediately thinking about the risks, to think about how would you support that and what is it that they get from that that matters to them. And often it's about being in the outdoors that really matters. Um, I, I, that's, I don't know if I've over talked there. No, 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 not, <laughs> not, not at all. You gave me the perfect message. I now have coffee, which was amazing. <laughs> I, I got, um, and I heard the whole thing, even though I wasn't on camera. Uh, that's that's brilliant because you're absolutely right. I mean, I think we, we've got a session later today to talk about missing incidents where I think that is about mm -hmm. tracking. And I think it's it's amazing that you can do both. Right. I mean, yes. you can potentially subtly use these things to keep and and, and that tracking. Um, I was at a DRI event recently where they looked at that in the house to see which rooms people were spending more time in and what time of day they spent the times in to see if how routines had been affected and how long they sat in one place to see whether um, people who had carers or lived with somebody who was opposed to either visiting somebody who came in and had the care how that affected their daily routine and stuff so there's obviously clever ways to use this and supporting people to remain active or to go independently on that bike ride is such a great idea and I imagine it scares the 
crap out a lot of people watching the idea that they might do that is that changing as we find that the older people that you're working with now we're not talking about people who grew up in the you know in the 50s and 60s necessarily in the same way anymore we're talking about people who've had smartphones before they used and are more familiar with technology is that becoming easier to do as as we work with a younger a, a group of people that you know are I don't want to say younger because clearly they're not younger, but but you know what I mean. That the adult life's been spent in since the development of some of these technologies. Mm. Absolutely, and you definitely, if you'd spoken about this twenty years, I mean, we didn't have GPS tracking in the same way then. But certainly, old what the people we class as older people or people who are getting their early stage dementia diagnosis, still living at home, but starting to consider what should they be doing to be safe. Should when when do I need to give up driving? When do I need to stop doing certain things? And they're trying to future plan, and their family around them is thinking about safety. Often, the thing that scares people is the wild outdoors. They say, oh, we don't mind you going for a dog walk as long as you don't go into the woods. But the person says, but I always go into the woods and that's where I enjoy walking the dog. That's yeah. the point of having the dog. Um, but we are seeing definitely that there are more and more people who, in, who have really perfectly good technology skills and who are very willing and desperate to use the technology that there is out there to support them. And often I find it's the sometimes NHS and social care staff who have less less skills than the clients. And do um, you worry, oh, no, 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 Steve, go ahead. Steve. Uh, do you worry about there being like a digital divide? As we all know, like some poor people don't have access to the same technology and things as some other people, and perhaps some of these people who have perhaps a support network to help them with this technology and then actually be able to afford to buy the latest technology may actually be able to continue living the good life but some other people may be kind of left behind if they don't have such a access absolutely i think that's a a, a definite issue here so yeah there will be the, the people that i interviewed were people who had already gone and sorted this in this technology out and were using mm -hmm. it they were essentially all affluent people who had the ability to not only purchase and use this technology but become familiar with it and support networks around them there's a massive digital divide which has huge implications for how do we support people who don't have access and how do we support people who've not had that historic ability to get access who don't have that familiarity but it doesn't take away from the fact that there are a lot of people out there who need support who do have these skills and do have these resources so i think um certainly when when you work clinically i i i always have clients who you would love to give a million pieces of kit and equipment out as an ot to but that there's no resource and others who literally get out their checkbook and say what do i need where do i where do i buy it um but we still support everybody so um, it would be lovely to think that we could understand how to make this more accessible to a wider range of people. Um, and that might well be what we're looking at going forward. But I think at the moment, yeah, the, the idea that somebody with early stage dementia gets to continue being a cyclist because they can clap a, a strap a very expensive piece of GPS technology onto the front of their bike is definitely for a particular group of people. For sure. and, that, and that doesn't have to just be leisure activities, does it? I mean, that could be a practical thing for, you know, whether that's going to the grocery shop or going to the market, which you've always done on a Saturday morning because they like to buy their apples from them. I mean, I don't know if markets still exist or going to the library, you know, practical daily activities that are, are, are also leisure. Um, thank you, Esme. We're going to come back to you. I'm going to go to um, Stefan and Stephen now. Tell us about because you're specifically it's the enliven project is that right tell us about enliven do you want to start off Stefan? yeah sure um so um, enliven is um so it, it's a project where we're trying to um find ways of helping older people with uh, dementia get outdoors into nature in the context of the visitor economy so working with a tourist businesses that have attractions but also organizations that offer uh, some kind of event or tour or workshop or something out, outside. Um, and so we've uh, spoken to um, a lot of businesses and organizations, actually a lot of them were charities and CICs, other kinds of organizations, not just businesses, and also people with dementia and also their supporters to find out, um, okay, what, what's what's in the way? What, what do you want to do? Um, why might you want to do it? But what's in the way? Um, what blocks businesses maybe from doing this easily? What do they need to know? Uh, and also um, 
uh, for, for people to mention, well, what do you want? And what sort of things do you do outside? And um, what gets in the way there? So, um, yeah, we're just at a stage now where we're moving from having kind of gathered that and done that research to thinking about engaging a selection of organisations to actually do some project that they've come up with um, to actually realise uh, some kind of improvement or new activity for, for people in dementia in, in their organisation. So that's not just big organisations, you know, we're not just talking about like the National Trust or somebody like that that have these kind of big outdoor facilities, but you're also talking about kind of small community projects, I guess. And you've yeah. got the, I mean, in your, is the Eden project down in your part of the world, the Eden thing, is that places like that? Does that count as outside? Centre parks. Um, I want to say, I want to say centre parks should be doing this as well. That's um, a very good question whether the Eden project counts as outside. There is a lot <laughs> outside, isn't there? So yeah, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. It's it's that kind of thing from that kind of scale. Uh, right what about how, the, how the they market. adapt? So how they adapt? So selling the benefits, how they adapt, and then be able to to do this um, as well. And this is where you could see that some of the tech that Esme discovers could then be used by some of those places to support people so you don't necessarily have to buy it you can you know use it because it's there at these places to use yeah it's not also about this the technology though sometimes it's just about being friendly and welcoming because a lot of people just want to be treated like an individual so a lot of the things people said were sometimes they get treated a certain way because they have to mention or they try to control what they're doing but really i think the most important thing is just like treat the person like you treat anyone and if they need any help or just uh, be just responsive to them rather than trying to put them in the boxes this person has to mention we'll do this it's about thinking about okay we're going to give them time perhaps we'll give them extra time perhaps give them space where they need to just uh, take a moment or perhaps to provide more information before they arrive just so they can plan out where they're going to go what they're going to do so it's just there's a lot of little things from just more information to more practical things like private perhaps pride in toilets or more places to sit sit or perhaps even more advanced stuff like technology. So there's a whole array of from different levels that businesses and organisations can do to actually help people to mention, visit them and go to them. And do we do we know, I mean, do we, is the evidence there that, that there are benefits to this, you know, to these things, to going outside? Is the evidence already there or is that something you're having to work on as well? Um, well, so part of the alignment project is that we've been doing a scoping review where I've been looking at different papers and there is really strong evidence of biological um, benefits. So people relate to like agitation or stress or quality of life that really improves why people get out into nature. And also just people just feeling that they have a place that they belong and there's um, so many benefits. So in our interviews, people talked about the feeling of freedom, of calmness, being rejuvenated when they get to go out into nature. And also it's just about like the social aspect, either like meet new people or just like perhaps forming stronger connections to people they already know, like friend, friends and family. So there's like a multitude of benefits that people really get out of just from being outside and being in nature. And I, I guess, Esme, this probably comes up as a, an issue because mobility issues, can, I would imagine, would be seen as a barrier to this, you know, particularly because people who live with Alzheimer's disease or dementia, the chances are that's not the only problem that they've got. I mean, Chris was at the start of the day talking about he had emphysema, but we're going to have other people who also have, you know, bad hips and knees or, or lots of different reasons why walking around or exercising is an issue. How, how do you overcome those mobility issues to encourage this? I know yours is like people who want to, do these things but how are there ways that are strategies or ways we can overcome that when people think they start to kind of develop that view well i can't i can't walk mm -hmm. outside on my own how do we overcome that mentally challenge i think certainly as an occupational therapist working in um clinical areas i've always found that grading activities makes a huge difference people often think about the biggest version of what they used to do so they'd say you know i used to go here and walk three times around the lake before going to the coffee shop i couldn't possibly do that now and then so therefore i won't be able to go and do that outdoor activity and that's really you know disappointing and distressing but sometimes it's about breaking it down and working out what what version of that can they do and how do you help people see the small chunks that they can do a bit at a time and grading an activity to be achievable and the just right challenge for that person so they still get the the satisfaction and the experience they wanted but maybe that it's not as challenging if it's mobility or it could be other issues that that affect somebody um so really grading is the key to that i think and i, and I guess uh stefan and steve and 
from your perspective, I guess businesses or places, you know, can help that by using the right kind of marketing promotion, putting those right facility, you know, not creating barriers for those places to be. Yeah, on the, on the mobility side, a lot more organisations are know about, or at least, or are starting to use tramfers, for example, um, in open spaces. Which is, sorry, what are they? They are like four by four um, electric scooters, and um, there there are groups of um, people who use these use these tramfers on Darmal, so they they can they can really go places. Um, if you know the main barrier then becomes styles rather than uneven ground or anything it it, it does mm. change things for for people i think so um i think incrementally we're seeing more and more um organizations offering those and then the next step is you're right uh showing in a in a way that's appropriate that we have these kinds of things that are, are suitable for for people with either mobility issues or with um some form of cognitive impairment so um you know, one of the one of the things about that information is on your website don't just say you're uh, um, dementia friendly show it show show the the visual story or, or whatever it is that that allows people to assess for themselves okay is this place for me does it work for me uh, where am i going to find the things that i need and um, putting that on your websites i mean places i'm even be very good at doing that for for people living with disabilities are they up to now or mm -hmm. I'm a dog owner. I go to websites now to see whether they're going to let my dog in first. This is a bad analogy. I don't know, you know, but but putting that information in there as to what you can do it is helpful. I mean, then which giving forces people, you to think about it as well. Yeah, giving people information that allows them to plan and look ahead and check whether this is something that they're going to potentially have some difficulties or not is key. So um, it sounds really really obvious, but if you can provide a map on your website or in your leaflets that shows the outdoor space and things that are in it. So where is there going to be steep ground? Where are there going to be accessible toilets? Where might there be benches? So you could you could stage your walk around those, you know, so that people can look at something and say, I think I could do that. But when they can't see that information before they even go, they're going to really struggle, I think, to, to know whether it'll be OK. So some people would take that, that, that risk and go and say, we'll see what's there. When other people say, oh, no, I, I probably better not. And that's a shame, really, because that should be an accessible environment for all. I think one interesting thing that's came up with us as well, we found is that people say they're able to t uh, walk further when they actually have like an enjoyable activity and things. So if you try to create things that are, like fun and interesting, people actually sometimes can walk a bit longer. Or there was one person saying how her mother would stay out a lot longer when, even when it was cold because she was having such a great time. So if you provide, if you try to cater to some interesting things that people enjoy, I don't say they all the mobility issues will go away. It's just they probably they can actually do more than perhaps some people actually realise when they're actually really enthused and excited about doing something. And putting those activities on. I mean, those kind of those outdoor places have been doing this for a long time for children, haven't they? During school holidays, they're great at designing kids' school holiday events. I think putting things on throughout the year for for older people that have had that mock you'd like to see this being normal and routine all the time but by you know putting things on specifically and do they do that i think um one of the uh one of the things that might be uh, changing slowly is, is this perception about um how autonomous a person with dementia can be so um i certainly had conversations with organizations that said you know well yeah we run we run an event and, and it's they, they've got to come with carers uh, and, and they'll come and actually changing that perception that actually somebody with dementia can come themselves and go and do an activity themselves that they enjoy outside and um you know okay there might yeah be and, uh, and sorry i should call it i wasn't suggesting that we treat older people like children but I'm, what i meant was their ability to think about a specific group of people and what they need from an event and i think quite often that just doesn't happen with older people they're just a bit overlooked in that respect and probably it's a bit of a society issue as well how there's a bit of stigma so sometimes there'd be people they didn't want to go to events marketed for people to mention because they felt mm. perhaps uncomfortable with that so it's about kind of addressing some perhaps stigma or some perceptions about people with dementia so people and so there's it, not this just thing being about more, more mindful i mean and we mm. know also as well you know cinemas have specific screenings don't they for for mm. um certain people as well i think it, it's a great idea you're all doing such brilliant work is there anything for anybody who's watching who's interested in what uh, is there any outputs from your research yet that people can can maybe use in their day-to-day -day lives is there any way you'd like to signpost people to 
Um, Stephen, Stefan, I'll declare you. Um, I think um, if everyone wanted to look at our Enliven website, you'll see all the latest things we're doing. They can sign up to our newsletter, we will provide updates. And yeah, if you get in contact with us, we have different forums and things that take place that you might be able to attend. And so, yeah. That's always, brilliant. Yeah. And is that just down in Exeter? Is that just down in the southwest? Or well, most it's online at the moment, so you could join online. But we're hoping to do in-person events. Maybe not sure at the moment. We've we've COVID and things. We've been pretty much all online. But we'll see what the future holds in terms of where we'll hold future events. That's brilliant. Thank you. Uh, that's great. So go to what's the website? It's enliven dot. That's a good. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, you'll tweet it. He's going to tweet it, <laughs> or post it in the post it in the chat afterwards. Not on the Zoom chat because that doesn't come out on the live stream. What about you, Esme? Um, so, although we've published um, the original systematic review that looked at the background to this, um, which can be found on the Journal of Enabling Technologies, um, the the main output so far has been me speaking directly to other practitioners and occupational therapists about how to guide their day to day practice and think more widely about the use of technology than maybe its original purpose. Um, so, I, I hope to write this up as a published article at some point <laughs> but uh, at this point I don't have anything to direct you to but that's all right I think I think the the thought is there about how you can have a strong think about how you can use technology to enable that thank you very much for my brilliant guests Dr Esme uh, Wood uh, from the University of Gloucester Dr Stephen Owen and Dr Stephen Price from the University of Exeter thank you so much for, for yeah. joining me as we hit the almost halfway mark <laughs> Thank you. And uh, my next guests have started to arrive. We've had uh, Dr. Aitana Sogor Estevez, who's been on the camera for a little while there. And Hello. we've uh, got Dr. Nicholas Ashton with us as well. So move Hello. on. Uh, so over the next half an hour, um, from 3 to 3.30, we're going to be talking about biomarkers. Uh, if you missed the sessions earlier today, you'll remember that these are biological markers that can be an indication of, of, of Alzheimer's disease or other dementias as well, that these are the physical things we're talking about. And um, my guests today specifically are going to talk about how we could diagnose dementias with a drop of blood. We've heard so much today about other things, about gait and eyes and and genetics and other ways to diagnose dementia and how we then put that information to use so this is going to be a fascinating next half hour but before we go to that of course it's my half hourly reminder that one of the reasons why we're doing this today is to raise money for four brilliant charities the Louis body society alzheimer's research uk alzheimer's society and race against dementia um all fund uh, research and aitana is a race <laughs> against dementia fellow uh, yes. And she's going to talk about her work, and I'm sure she could testify that they do brilliant work and fund research, which is vitally important to helping beat dementia across all areas of research, not just in basic science or fundamental science, but also in clinical research and care as well. Uh, if you go to chatathon.uk forward slash donate or go to the chatathon.uk website, you'll find a link there. Please do give what you can. I know things are tough right now. But honestly, if, if anything counts, uh, no matter how big or small, it will make a, a big difference. And 25% of everything you give today will go to Race Against Dementia. We should have a third guest. She's obviously running late. <laughs> so we'll, uh, while we're waiting to see if our next gifts arrive, I will just take 30 seconds um, to play a quick film, which is a good reminder. This time I'm going to get the right one, which is because, of course, it is the World Cup right now, and so what better film to watch than this one? Well, with players like David Beckham, you do feel there are certain moments of destiny. Yes! Football should be unforgettable. Unforgettable goals. Unforgettable saves. Unforgettable moments. Unfortunately, some people will forget. Fans like Steve and Sheila and Tommy. But with a better understanding of dementia, we can help all those living with it. Alzheimer's Society 
and the FA supporting fans and players affected by dementia.